Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And in today's episode, our 285th episode, we have a bunch of news, including a new sauropod track site, which is in a really insane place. I think it's pretty unbelievable that people even found it. (laughs) We also have some dinosaur exhibits and dinosaurs in video games. Also in this episode, we have an interview with Scott Persons and Beth Zakin, the author and illustrator of the recent book Megarex, which is all about Scotty. The T-Rex, but not named after Scott Persons. That's correct, although you can see how people would make that mistake. And we have Dinosaur of the Day, Shunosaurus. But before we get into all of that good stuff, as always, we like to thank some of our patrons who keep our podcast running. And this week, we'd like to thank Chris, Nicholas, Trent Carbajal, Stefan, Taya, Stego Sophie, Ayumi, Paula Canthus, Jackson Crawford, Sorian Brandy, Mayu, Dino Bo, Mellow Stego, Workersaurus, Kaylin, and Duncansaurus. Thank you so much. We really appreciate all your support. And we're only 11 new patrons away from our next milestone where we'll send you some art that we made. So if you want some really nice Sabrina crafted art, make sure you join soon. And you can join at patreon.com slash I know Dino. And we have other rewards such as our discord where you can chat with the rest of the dinosaur enthusiast community. Yep, that's my personal favorite. And we still have our dinosaur game server running which is an oft-forgot reward. But if you play ARC, it's a good place to play. Jumping into the main event. Well, I guess there's also the interview, which is a pretty main event. And the dinosaur of the day. That's true. The main sauropod event. Oh, I like that. (laughs) So this article was published in JVP and written by Jean-David Moreau and others. And in it, they describe some sauropod trackways which were found on the roof of a cave not too unlike some other dinosaur track site finds we found before. But this cave is crazy. The cave is named Castel Bouc, which is, I think, how you say it in French. It's in southern France. And the track site is half a kilometer or 1,600 feet under the surface of the earth. So you have to go way down to get into this cave. And the gallery that they're in is quite large. It's up to 76 meters long, 22 meters wide, and 11 and a half meters high, or 250 by 72 by 38 feet high. Sounds like quite the spelunking adventure to get to these. Oh, man. In order to get into this cave. So for a long time, they knew if you went half a kilometer down, there was a cave in the area, and it was called like Chamber 4. And they just knew the tip of the iceberg, basically. And then they found this really crazy winding passageway that they had to excavate a bunch of rocks from and stuff. And then there was this massive cave that was like 10 times as big behind it, which is the one I just described how big it was. And that excavation that connects the old little cavern part to the new part, they describe as accessing by, quote, crawling along very narrow labyrinthine conduits about 100 meters long, end quote. Wow. So it's over 300 feet of crawling. And then they say on top of that, quote, because some portions of these small conduits periodically flood, access to the far galleries requires caution and is limited to drought periods, end quote. So in other words, if you accidentally went in there and it started to rain, you would almost certainly drown because you'd have to try to like crawl out really fast before it flooded. It sounds terrifying. It's pretty dangerous. I cannot handle spelunking is what I realized from reading this description. Like crawling for a hundred meters in a thing that can flood really rapidly, it's too much. So <laughs> getting to the trackways, there are three separate trackways on the roof in this awesome cavern. They're all from the middle Jurassic. Obviously, they were laid down within a few days, maybe years of one another, but you know, definitely not millions of years apart. They are estimated to be between 166 and 168 million years old which is a really rare time period. We've talked before about how the late Jurassic is a lot better known than the middle Jurassic. And the authors say the only other middle Jurassic sauropod tracks in France were actually just a tree trunk trace and some erosion. So these now should count as the only known middle Jurassic sauropod tracks in France. It looks like the tracks were originally laid down on a beach or near a lagoon because they're sort of a combination of marine sediments but then it has some sort of 
sedimentology that makes it look a little bit like there was some freshwater flood type thing happening. So maybe it was a little bit mixed up. But what's really interesting to me about this is the fact that this was found in a naturally formed cave and not in an underground mine or some other excavation, because that's usually what we talk about. Like people are digging a tunnel for a highway and then they stumble into a bone or a print or something. But this is just in a regular cave that they walked into and it was just on the ceiling already. These types of caves are called karstic caves and karstic refers to the fact that the caves were formed by water slowly dissolving the rock. Usually it's limestone. That makes sense. There's still a lot of water in that cave. Yeah, exactly. From what I can tell, it's the most common type of cave, karstic caves. It's the only type of cave I think I've been in because they're full of stalactites and stalagmites. So they're really pretty and they're exciting to go into. A lot of times they have large open spaces so you can go in and get a good view. Sometimes you go in on a boat like at Waitomo. And that's the glowworm caves in New Zealand. Unfortunately, no dinosaur tracks in there. No, but the glowworms are cool. <laughs> they are. And the cave is literally cool. Yeah. Near Castel Buc, there are also two other occurrences of theropod tracks in nearby caves in southern France. But as far as I can tell, those are the only other dinosaur tracks in karstic caves, or at least they're the only ones mentioned in this paper. So they're super rare. It's really cool. And the pictures of the cave are pretty astonishing, too. It's definitely worth checking out. All the all the news articles about it have the pictures of the cave. And it's like two little tiny people in the corner in this massive cave, sauropod tracks on the ceiling. We'll have a link in our show notes. As I mentioned, there are three trackways. They're abbreviated CAS 1, 2, and 3. But I'm just going to call them CAS 1, 2, and 3 because that's easier to say. So CAS 1 is described as well-preserved with both manual or front foot and pez or hind foot prints. So it's a pretty good trackway. It's got 12 pez and 10 manual tracks for a total of 22 prints. The pez prints are about one meter or three feet long, <laughs> which is insanely big for a, a footprint, but it's not that insane for a sauropod. The pez print is about five times the area of the manis print, and as usual, the manis print is sort of this D shape in front of the pez print where it looks sort of like the foot, front foot went down and then the back foot just mushed over the top of it and maybe covered up a bunch of the track. Or otherwise, the hand print just didn't go as deep and it's just the front of the track or something because it's a, they always look kind of weird when they have the hand and foot together. And since they have several of the tracks in the row, they can tell that its stride was about 3.1 to 3.5 meters or 10 to 11 foot per step, which is crazy. That's a large step. <laughs> it is. CAS 2 is a little bit less complete. It has only seven PEZ and three manual tracks. It's almost in the opposite direction from CAS 1. It crosses over, so sort of like a really low angle X, maybe like a TIE fighter, that sort of angle of tracks, but then going in opposite directions on top of that. And CAS 2's stride was about... 3.2 to 3.6 meters or 10 to 12 feet so ever so slightly longer than cas1 and its track size is pretty similar to cas1 as well cas3 only has three pez prints which at first would make you think oh this is a boring track site all the exciting stuff's in the other two but the cas3 prints have the best detail they describe them as exquisite including claws and the pads of the feet ooh yeah, the claws are amazingly preserved. In the past, we've talked about how the claws are sort of curved, angled to the side a little bit, and you can see them so clearly in these tracks. They look perfect, almost like they were just drawn on the ceiling or something because they have just such great outlines in the photogrammetry. We can really see the details for how long the length of the claws were, mm. and you, there's all five of them, too, all in a row, just curved over. Wow. And no signs of turtles or anything. <laughs> Not in this case, no. Yeah. Just wanted to point that out. Maybe that's what the hands were stepping on. Mm, I don't think so. <laughs> or smashing the turtles. No, there's no evidence. We don't know. Probably not. Probably not. You're right. So let's just say not. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll give you that one this time. So CAS 3 is parallel to CAS 2. And the stride is about 4.4 meters or 14 feet long. 
And as you'd expect, the tracks are bigger than the other two at about 1.2 meters or four feet long, which makes it like one of the largest sauropod tracks that we have. That's a really massive track. There are a few unique features of the tracks based on CAS 1 and CAS 3. They named a new Ichno taxa. The new Ichno genus is named Uxitanopodus, although it's spelled like Ocitanopodus, but I'm using the French pronunciation because it's named after the Uxitani region in France where it was found. And the Ichno species is Gondai, after the French paleoichnologist Professor Georges Gon. There's not a lot of sauropods from the area really period, including bones. Obviously, we said that there weren't any other Middle Jurassic prints known from France, but really the only one sort of from the time period is Cediosaurus. So it's possible that this could have been Cediosaurus, but the number of manus claws matches what they expect to see on titanosaur forms. And Cediosaurus isn't considered to be a titanosaur, so it doesn't seem to be a very good match. And so the authors think there's likely still an unknown large titanosaur from the middle jurassic of europe that we haven't found yet oh uh, good more sauropods yeah might be a long time till we find it though i'm willing to wait speaking of sauropods dippy the diplodocus is on well was on tour and dippy's tour is currently suspended so dippy's hanging out at its penultimate stop on the uk tour which is at rochdale's number one riverside good use of penultimate yes so there's one more stop after this, in other words. Well, it's unclear if the tour will continue. Oh, no. So the penultimate might become the ultimate. Yes. But the Natural History Museum in London plans to build a new life-size dippy sculpture to go in their front gardens. And the museum wants to install three replicas of Hypsilophodon as well, and then have all the dinosaur sculptures as part of a new biodiversity hub which will have this living lab for scientists and volunteers and visitors to show people about evolution and changes to nature in urban areas. Parts of it, the description when I read it sounded kind of like the original intent behind Crystal Palace dinosaurs hmm. in terms of you're walking through a garden-like thing and you can better understand deep time through these sculptures and the way the gardens are laid out. That's cool. Yeah, so there's going to be multiple gardens and lawns and an activity and learning center, courtyards, a place to plant in the gardens. The contract to build this is going to cost about a million pounds, and the museum's currently looking for contractors, and they're planning to have everything built by 2023. Nice. A million pounds is pretty cheap for all that work. Yeah, it was unclear to me if the million pounds went mostly to the dinosaur sculptures, or oh. if it was for everything. Hmm. It'd be cool if it was just for the dinosaur sculptures. Those could be some pretty awesome dinosaur sculptures then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> In other uh, museum-ish news, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science recently posted a map that shows where dinosaur fossils have been found in Denver and the surrounding areas. And it's a pretty fun map. It's full of red dots that shows you where the fossils have been found. And these are fossils that have been found since 1887 in the area. Ooh, that's yeah. a lot. Yeah. And then they have these dinosaur silhouettes to show the significant discoveries of different Triceratops, Taurosaurus, Tyrannosaurus, and Ornithomimus specimens. And there's a lot of those, too. So they're they're splitting, at least on their map. Yeah. Triceratops and Taurosaurus. Well, they're also saying Denver is one of the few places where you can theoretically find dinosaurs in your own backyard. Hmm, this is true. In more pop culture news, specifically comics, Flash, The Fastest Man Alive, number three, came out on May 8th. And in the story, Flash has to team up with the Atom to keep the city safe from dinosaurs, for any comics fans, specifically Flash fans, who also like dinosaurs. And in game news, there's a new game, Second Extinction, which is a three-player co-op shooter game, and you have to kill mutated dinosaurs that have taken over the planet. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah you can form groups or play solo. So the Second Extinction is you making them go extinct? I guess so. <laughs> good, good point. So the, the description of the game says, quote, as the dinosaurs took over our planet, some people made their escape to an orbital station set up by a group called the ERA. Humanity has licked its wounds and now returns to find out more about this unbelievable enemy. This is where the extinction war begins. Players pick from a roster of four survivors from around the world, a group that will continue to grow after launch. Interesting. Yeah, pretty epic sounding. It is. That's obviously what you do if dinosaurs start to take off for the Earth, flee to space 
and regroup <laughs> before coming back. <laughs> Why hide in a bunker when you could go to outer space? This is not the first story that involves dinosaurs and fighting in space, though. <laughs> That's true. There's multiple books about this, at least. And then there's, there's probably other games and other forms of media out there, too. Yeah. I guess it's a little bit like Halo or something. Make this off-world colony of humans as a jumping-off point. Yeah. In the other spectrum of dinosaur-type games, well... This isn't a specifically dinosaur game, but there are dinosaurs in the game. The gamer posted about Animal Crossing and how you have the ability to combine fossils to create custom dinosaurs. Custom, as in just poorly assembled? You do whatever you want. (laughs) So one of their examples, one of the funnier ones, is a Diplodocus, where it's only the neck, and then you've got a skull on each side of the neck. Okay. Because I guess you build a museum, a natural history museum, and then they said, oh, if you have leftover specimens or fossils, piece them together how you want. And one person has called that particular one with the Diplodocus that's only a neck and two heads, the Saurosaurus. What does that mean? It's just double Saurus. Oh. (laughs) Anyway, I've been thinking about getting into this game, but I'm a little worried that I will get obsessed. So I'm holding off for now. Yeah, I might be the only one doing this podcast if Sabrina starts playing it because she might not have time anymore. (laughs) Could be a problem. And now we're going to go on to our interview with the team behind the new book Megarex. But as a quick reminder, we have an unabridged version for all of our patrons. So if you want to hear more, grab that from your premium content feed. We're chatting today with Dr. Scott Persons and Beth Zakin, who both worked on the upcoming book, uh, Megarex, which is, it's coming out later this year, I believe in October, but it is a great book. It's about a Tyrannosaurus named Scotty. That's actually the subtitle. And Dr. Scott Persons is a paleontologist and professor at the College of Charleston and the Mace Brown Museum of Natural History. And Beth Zakin is an artist and illustrator who specializes in natural science communication. We got a chance to see the book before it came out, and we both loved it. Right, Garrett? Yes, really an excellent book. It's a different sort of take on dinosaur science because it really focuses on one find predominantly, which is a nice way to look at it. Could you guys tell us a little bit about your roles in making this book? Sure. So my role, I helped to design some of the early concepts for the Royal Saskatchewan uh, Museum's new display on Scotty. And the book has sort of evolved out of that project. I've also been involved with uh, helping the Royal Saskatchewan Museum for um, the last probably year and a half working on Scotty uh, together with the staff there. Also knowing that this was going to hopefully find its way into a book ultimately. Very happy to see it finally coming out. Yeah, maybe we should clarify, for, and it's clarified in the book, Scotty the T-Rex is not named after you, right, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. No, no, no. I was, uh, geez, I was probably in third or fourth grade when Scotty got its official name. <laughs> <laughs> so the process starting when you were in third or fourth grade all the way till today, why did it take so long, I guess would be the not so nice way to say it. Took a long time for, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first one being uh, Scotty is just so gosh darn big. Um, so just the amount of time it takes to dig up an animal of that size is, is, is a lot of hours that have to be put into it. But also uh, it's really because the sediment that Scotty was preserved in was a very, very hard sandstone, sandstone pretty rich in iron. Scotty was preserved in sort of a sand bar in a uh, prehistoric uh, riverbed. And because the rock was just so gosh darn tough, it took forever to chisel it out and remove it. So this was all really fine work with an air scribe sort of just tediously going through layer by layer. Absolutely. And that's uh, that's what the first part of the book is about, the discovery of Scotty and then the long process of excavation and all the various challenges that were met 
uh, Deering and being being so gosh darn large, you know, pull out the huge plaster jacket that contained Scotty's massive uh, hip and the big jacket that had the femur. In it. And then there was also this enormous skull block. They had to bring in um, some pretty heavy duty equipment. They needed to bring in some big cranes. And at one point, uh, they actually had to bring in a team of horses to pull the big jackets out because they couldn't get the heavy machinery close enough. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I love that part. It, is. it was a very old school excavation in that regard. You look at some of the old photos of uh, Barnum Brown and the Sternbergs doing things with, uh, with horse and wagon. It was sort of a, a, a miniature trip back in time. <laughs> yeah. Did you guys use any explosives? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so not quite that old school. <laughs> <laughs> I really liked in the book, too, there's these pages of Team Rex and you highlight the different people who are all part of the process. And that I think is really great at illustrating to people who maybe like the most you usually hear about is like, all right, this dinosaur was found. This is what we know about it. But now we get to see, okay, there's so many people involved and these are all the things that have to go in to get to this point. It was a it was a massive undertaking, and many many people were involved in in many many different ways. And I I really arrived very very late to the story. I got to do a really really cool part, which was writing up the scientific description of Scotty. I was only able to do that because the fossils had been found, they'd been dug up, they'd been cleaned, and they'd been prepared. So Beth, at what point did you come into the project? I came in to kind of act as the conduit between paleontologists like Scott and the general public. Um, I'm sort of a filter that helps to tell Scotty's story. Uh, So I've been helping kind of along the way to tell different parts of Scotty's narrative. So we have things that range from little Scotty hatchlings to uh, Scotty's death scene in the book. (laughs) That is, yeah, quite the range. (laughs) (laughs) It's his whole life. It is, yeah. (laughs) So how do you, I guess, what's your process for illustrating, for bringing those scenes to life? I generally kind of think of myself as like a natural history super fan. So I have sort of like a an image of like a wildlife documentary of Scotty's life that ends up playing in my mind. And I do my best to try to work with the scientists and the museum preparators to bring that story to the page uh, in a way that excites people and, you know, tells that narrative. Mm-hmm. And I like there's a there's a thread going on as well about uh, the Akira Raptor with Scotty. <laughs> <laughs> yes, his what's, little nemesis. <laughs> what's the, yeah, what's what's the story behind that? <laughs> so I wanted to um, to open the book up when you were in Scotty's world, and I played around first with the idea of the introduction being from Scotty's perspective. The problem with that is if you feel like you are Scotty, you don't get a sense for the scale of Scotty. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted a dinosaur that was pretty close to human size, that could interact, that could run across Scotty and would still convey to the reader what it would be like to stand in the presence of such a massive animal. And so, yeah, our our little raptor, our dromaeosaur there at at the beginning of the book was uh, was my approach to that. (laughs) Yeah, and even uh, Scotty's death scene, right? That's the raptor. Oh, maybe I'm spoiling things for people who haven't <laughs> yeah. seen it yet. <laughs> oh, spoiler, the Tyrannosaur dies. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I hope people knew that part already. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so the it's also, it's about Scotty, but it's also kind of about Tyrannosaurus in general and the sorts of things we do and don't know about this genus. So one of the things that I learned from the book was that Scotty, maybe in particular, but maybe Tyrannosaurus in general, have a sort of horn-shaped protuberance <laughs> on the side of their head. Yeah, they've, they've got a couple. Yeah, so on, on the side of the head, they're sort of at, at the cheek region. They've got that that jugal horn or that jugal spike. And you know, once someone points it out to you, you do a Google search for it, and you'll see, oh yeah, there is something sticking up there. But you ask kids to you know name a horn dinosaur. And they'll say Triceratops, Styracosaurus, what have you. Uh, but Tyrannosaurus rex is also a correct answer to uh, to that question. Mm-hmm. It does have a, a small little horn right there. It's also got a bigger uh, sort of cranial lump uh, just over its eye. 
Yeah, is was Scotty any different than other tyrannosaurs, or have I just always missed this feature? <laughs> well, you so it is very noticeable on one side of Scotty's face, the presence in particular of the the, the jugal horn. But no, it's on it's on most of them. And again, you do a Google search for it, and uh, and you'll be surprised by by what you spot. That's cool. And there, of course, is there's evidence on the texture of uh, of the horn itself it's the texture is very similar to what you would actually see on the scoot and armored scoot from say an ankylosaur mm. or even the much larger jugal horn of a, of a ceratopsian so there's evidence of a lot of blood vessels that were flowing across the surface and that is indicative of the presence of a sheath of keratin same stuff your fingernails are made of same stuff that covers the claws of uh, most modern day critters and the same stuff that uh, covers the horn of say a uh, a, a bison or a goat, and that most certainly would have covered the horn of Trinosaurus rex or Triceratops or the scoot of an ankylosaur. Yeah, what, what I was going to say is that the reconstructions that we sort of settled on for Scotty are generally pretty conservative. Um, this was sort of an evolving process, and a lot of people uh, gave me feedback on the original versions, but it took three or four versions, this might be the fourth version that we settled on, especially with those sort of like eyebrow bumpers. <laughs> yeah, they were clawed back a little bit from how I originally had. <laughs> They're still pretty massive. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy them. Yeah, there's actually quite a bit of evidence for them being potentially larger. And I like to think of them as protruding from Scotty's face in places where um, you'd see a lot of uh, interaction with other animals like maybe he was using his head to bat around animals to knock them off their feet so the horns are there to kind of protect his eyes which are very important to a t-rex when they're hunting yeah that's really cool <laughs> <laughs> not something you typically think about i think oh no yeah you're yeah. always thinking about the teeth yeah it's all the teeth with t-rex mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but speaking of the teeth how did you guys decide whether or not to have like lips or you know, what level of lip to put on Scotty? Uh, it was not necessarily my decision. There was a lot of uh, different people's inputs. And actually, the, the thinking was sort of evolving at the time uh, that the decision was made to land on that uh, upper teeth being exposed, sort of a more crocodilian take on his look. But that's kind of the great thing about T-Rex. It's sort of like the ultimate muse. There's always something new that people are thinking about it and uh, new ways to imagine it. So this is our Scotty, and uh, we're happy with him. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah. And I think the way that you sort of depict it is starting out fluffier and then reducing in fluff as it gets older. <laughs> is that right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think of baby T-Rex as being sort of like a fluffy little squeaky chick running around the feet of the <laughs> big T-Rex. Um, and then I have him sort of uh, lose more and more of that feathery plumage as uh, he gets bigger and older. So adult Scotty still has a little bit of sort of fuzz on his head. But whether or not we would even see that is entirely up to debate by paleontologists. Yeah, yeah. it is debated for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Earlier, we were talking a bit about debates and things that are kind of hot topics in paleontology. And so I kind of have to ask, because in the T-Rex survival guide, you've got Triceratops and Taurosaurus. Oh, oh, ab absolutely. And that uh, that debate's acknowledged in the text itself, where we talk about the fact that some paleontologists would argue, uh, of course, Taurosaurus may be the fully mature form of, of a species of, of Triceratops. Absolutely. Uh, now, regardless from Scotty's perspective of whether or not Taurosaurus and Triceratops are two different things or if they're just a different form of the same animal, there's still two slightly different critters it would have to contend with. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would have been pretty big contender <laughs> in, in, in either oh, case absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely that's one of the big points i tried to make in the survival guy is that you know these are things you have to be careful about uh attacking you give kids a toy triceratops and a toy tyrannosaur and they just smash them together and that's not the way a t-rex would attack a triceratops that would be suicide <laughs> you impale yourself even if even if you succeed at killing the triceratops you wind up being so badly injured in in the process it wouldn't be worth it to you You do not attack uh triceratops head-on or taurosaurs we'll keep that in mind 
<laughs> in case we ever find ourselves as a T-Rex. <laughs> it's, it's important to know. <laughs> yeah. And it's also, it kind of goes along with how you talk about how they needed to be camouflaged, whereas, you know, a lot of times they're depicted as just kind of screaming and running in head first. Mm -hmm. It's not maybe the most accurate. <laughs> but Beth, how did you decide on the coloring for the T-Rex? Scotty's coloration was another thing that uh, we had multiple iterations of. Uh, we kind of decided on this sort of muted, like mossy green color palette. Uh, it's based loosely on other crocodilians and things that we see in, in large uh, reptilian predators, but without committing to anything too strongly. So it ended up pretty, pretty muted, but it has a nice sort of modeled camouflage aspect to it, just enough to kind of break up his silhouette with that very characteristic counter shading that you see on a lot of animals. I also liked the illustration that goes with the walking softly. There's that one famous dinosaur film, the name escapes me at the moment, but you can always <laughs> hear the Tyrannosaurus Rex <laughs> coming. And if you think about that from the perspective of a prey species, right, if you're a duckbill dinosaur, well, you can have hearing that's better than Jeff Goldblum. You ought to know when the Tyrannosaurus is approaching, if that's the case. <laughs> and it absolutely wasn't. Tyrannosaurus rex got big pads. We know this from a Tyrannosaur footprints that had been found over in the Gobi Desert of, of Tarbosaurus. Big pads on the feet. I don't think you would hear Tyrannosaurus rex coming. Now, I've been in um, Terengiri National Park in, in Tanzania. Wake up in the morning, discover elephants have visit, visited our camp. They've stolen our water in the <laughs> night. You think a herd of elephants you would hear, but you don't. The reason you don't, because elephants have got huge cushioning pads uh, on their back feet. They're silent walkers. And T-Rex would have been too. Yeah, because yeah, a T-Rex and an elephant aren't too far off in weight. I, I would say not. <laughs> T-Rex is, is bigger than the biggest elephant we know, of, but they're, they're probably getting close there on the high end. And then Scotty in particular, what's his, he's like the, the ultimate survivor. Was it the longest live tyrannosaurs that we know of so far? Although I should say it, because we, you talk about in the book, right? We don't know for sure if Scotty was male or female. Yeah, it is, it is currently, um, currently unknown. There are no good morphological indicators that we're aware of on the Tyrannosaurus rex skeleton that tells us what the sex is. So Scotty is gender ambiguous, and I'm cool with that. From the comparisons that uh, I've been able to do, I've been doing some work on Sue the T-Rex uh, recently. And Scotty and Sue, we know, are very similarly sized, although slightly different um, in proportion, especially uh, their faces are very unique to me, to my eye. But they're very similar. Yeah, with with Scotty too. I believe that's the one where you cut in to look for lags and couldn't really discern any. Is that correct? That's that's right. That's right. So of course, the way you normally uh, try to go about aging a dinosaur is you do a section uh, through its bones and you look for those lines of arrested growth. So periods throughout the year, presumably seasonal, when it gets a little bit leaner, it's a little bit harder to accumulate food, you, you're growing at a slower rate. So you look for those annual indicators, and then you sort of calculate back using smaller specimens and figure out uh, how old the animal was when it died. And the thing about Scotty is it's actually so old, it reached the point where it stopped adding on a lot of extra bones, start, stopped expanding its bones outward, and instead began the slow process of remodeling the bone uh, that it had. So those extra years have been erased. Now we can look back at other tyrannosaurs that were still growing and figure out, well, Scotty must be beyond that point. But yeah, we, we cannot give you an, an exact age for it. Gotcha. I think that your best guess was roughly 40. Is that right? Uh, a, a little bit over 30. Oh, 30. Okay. That's significantly different. From Scotty's perspective, I'm sure it is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then the end of the book... Scott, you mentioned how the research on Scotty isn't over and mm -hmm. we don't know how Scotty died. Do you think we'll ever get to a point where we were able to figure out how Scotty died? 
Yes. Yeah, so as I say at the end of the book, I haven't been able to figure out how Scotty died. There are no big, big injuries or things like that. There's no evidence that Scotty was uh, predated on by another animal. There are no tooth marks, uh, big tooth marks or anything like that uh, to be seen. So I don't know the answer to that. But I would be shocked if ultimately someone doesn't turn out to be clever enough to solve that problem. Mm hmm. One of those unsolved mysteries. There's a few of those. <laughs> I feel like there's more <laughs> unsolved mysteries than there are solved mysteries. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because everything we learn leads us to the next series of questions that we don't. So absolutely. And that's the way it should be. And that's what keeps it fun. It yeah. does. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. For our listeners, then, what is the best way for them to learn about both of you, your your work and what you might be working on next? Well, you're, first off, you're encouraged to stop by the Mace Brown Museum of Natural History here at the College of Charleston in, in South Carolina, if you happen to be uh, in the neighborhood. Also, look out, we're going to have another fossil publication coming out. It's a field guide to common fossils. I'm working on that with Harbor as well. Mm, great. I have a number of projects in the works at any given time. You can find me on Twitter and on Instagram. The handle would be at B-Z-A-I-K-E-N. I'm also a uh, principal artist at Blue Rhino Studio, so i got to plug them. <laughs> yeah, I've been, uh, I've been with Blue Rhino for 12 years now. I'm uh, a principal artist and the lead muralist there. And, uh, oh, we have some really cool projects. I am not sure if I am allowed to tell you guys about this year. <laughs> But really, they're, they're going to be big and it's going to be lots more dinosaurs from us and um, a lot more paleo art coming out of us, too. Cool. Do they involve murals? Yeah, I've done I've done three large scale murals this year. And uh, the one that you'll be seeing next year is uh, it's all dinosaurs. And it's really oh, cool. big. It's a big deal. Nice. <laughs> Exciting. And Blue Rhino Studio is working on a life size Sue the T-Rex full reconstruction flesh and scales and teeth and everything cool nice is that going to be near the skeleton version of sue the t-rex um it will temporarily this is going to be part of a larger traveling exhibit about sue's world oh cool, cool. yeah so you won't just see it at the field museum you'll see it all over the country nice <laughs> that's awesome well thanks so much to both of you for taking the time to chat with us oh my pleasure yeah thanks for having me Thank you so much, Scott and Beth, for chatting with us and letting us read an advanced copy of the book. We really enjoyed it. For our listeners in Canada, the book is already out as of May 2nd. And if you're in the U.S., you can pre-order. The book will come out on October 6th, and we highly recommend it. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Shunosaurus, which was a request from Dinosaur 4602. So thanks. Shunosaurus was a sauropod that lived in the Middle Jurassic in what is now Sichuan Province in China, in the Sha Shi Miao Formation. It's medium size. Originally, it was estimated to be about 36 feet or 11 meters long, but later specimens showed it was smaller. And Gregory Paul estimated in 2010 that Shunosaurus was about 31 feet or nine and a half meters long and weighed three tons. That happens a lot with dinosaurs. Yeah. The first estimates are really grandiose and they shrink over time. Sometimes it goes the other way. Occasionally, yeah. So the tibia was about two-thirds the length of the femur, and Shunosaurus had five metatarsals, which are the foot bones, as well as a relatively small, narrow brain. Oh, small and narrow brain. That's sad. It's okay. It still did cool things because it was a sauropod. <laughs> the skulls of Shunosaurus that have been found are very different, but that could be because they were disarticulated. Some were narrow and pointy, and some were rounded and blunt. Multiple skulls, though. That's pretty good. Yeah, because sauropod skulls are often not found because they tend to be light and fragile and they're weakly connected to the rest of the skeleton. So in the case of Shunosaurus, its skull was proportionately lighter and smaller than Camarasaurus. Shunosaurus had a short neck for a sauropod, so it was probably a low browser that ate tough vegetation. Its dentary was about half the length of the jaw and it had at least 25 teeth. The upper and lower rows of the teeth interlocked and could shear past each other. So the lower jaw curved upward and the upper tooth row curved downward. And Chatterjee and Jung wrote in 2002 that they acted, quote, like a pair of garden shears, end quote. 
These shearing teeth could cut, quote, hard branches, stems, seeds, foliage of contemporary flora, such as conifers, ginkgos, cycads, ferns, and horsetails. Nothing quite like chewing on a cycad or a <laughs> horsetail. Yeah, not my choice of vegetation, but hey. Yeah, fortunately, they regrew teeth pretty easily. <laughs> so Shunosaurus had cylindrical and long spatulate teeth. No gastrolis have been found with Shunosaurus so far. It also had a pretty stiff tail, and it had a club tail with spikes. These spikes were two inches or five centimeters long, and they were cone-shaped. Oh, yeah. Yeah, see? Still a cool sauropod. It is a very cool sauropod. I forgot about the club tail. Right? And this club tail was short and wide, the club part of it. The bony club tail, it had three or four fused caudal vertebrae, so no dermal material like an ankylosaurs. But it probably used its tail for defense. The type species is Shunosaurus lii, and the fossils were first found in 1977 by students as part of a Sichuan Provincial Paleontological and Archaeological Preservation Training Class, which was hosted by the Zigong Museum. It was described and named in 1983 by Dong Juming, Zhou Shiwu, and Zhang Yihong. The genus name means shoe lizard, and shu is an ancient name for Sichuan. The species name is in honor of Bing Li, quote, the magistrate who governed what is now Sichuan province between 256 to 251 BC for the state of Qing during the Warring States period. He was particularly celebrated for his flood control measures along the Mingjiang River, which included the construction of the famed Dujiang Dike and irrigation system that are still functioning today. End quote. That's according to Zhu Ming, Shu Wu, and Yi Hong. Holy cow. They constructed a bunch of dams and dikes over 2,000 years ago that are still working today? Yes. I guess he deserves to get a, a dinosaur, dinosaur named name? after yeah. him. <laughs> There's probably a few things with his name. When you said 256 BC, I thought, what bearing could he possibly have on modern paleontology? But I guess without these flood preservation methods, maybe they wouldn't have even been able to get this dinosaur fossil. Man, who knows? So the holotype of Shunosaurus is a partial skeleton, and since the holotype was found, about 20 specimens have been found, some complete or nearly complete, some skulls, and some juveniles. 94% of the Shunosaurus skeleton has been identified, so it's one of the best-known sauropods. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, and at least 10 Shunosaurus skeletons have been found at one site, and that might mean that there was a flash flood or some other kind of catastrophe there. Because 100 million years ago, they hadn't built those flood control measures yet. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Oh, what bad timing. Ironically, it's named after a guy who made really good flood control measures. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> that may have been killed in a flood. Shunosaurus was really common in its habitat, so about 90% of the fossils found in its formation were Shunosaurus fossils. There's a second species, Shunosaurus zuliogingensis, which is in the Zigong Museum Guide for a smaller, older Shunosaurus, but that one hasn't been formally described, so it's a nomum nudum. Shunosaurus lived in a place that was lush with rivers and shallow lakes, and it had a lot of conifers, cycads, and ferns around. There was also a lot of soft mud, and that led to some really great fossilization and preservation. Other dinosaurs that lived in the same time and place included the sauropods, Datosaurus, Omeosaurus, Protognathosaurus, the Ornithopod, Shiaosaurus, the Stegosaur, Huayangosaurus, the Theropod, Gasosaurus, and the Ornithopod, Yandusaurus. There were also fish, amphibians, reptiles, and early mammals. Originally, the tail club fossils of Shunosaurus were thought to be the wrist bones of Stegosaurus, and then later thought to be part of Shunosaurus, but only because of an injury. And then more fossils were found, and it was confirmed that yes, Shunosaurus had a tail club. It always makes you wonder what other crazy things did dinosaurs have that we just don't see? Yeah. Because you don't usually find the end of the sauropod tail. <laughs> True. It could be anything back there. So Shunosaurus and Amaiosaurus were the first sauropods found with tail clubs, and the tail clubs supported Bob Bakker's idea that sauropods were terrestrial animals, not aquatic or semi-aquatic as we used to think. Yeah, clubs aren't so useful underwater. It's true. <laughs> Shunosaurus is considered to be a basal eusauropod. Chatterjee and Jung also wrote in 2002, quote, sauropods were undoubtedly the most spectacular of all dinosaurs and the largest terrestrial animals that have ever lived, 
They were the most successful clades of herbivorous dinosaurs in terms of diversity, abundance, and longevity with a temporal span of 160 million years, end quote. And yes, I felt the need to include that I quote. I know exactly why you put that in there. <laughs> Just because the ankylosaurs didn't live as long. They had better club tails. Sauropods were undoubtedly the most spectacular <laughs> of all dinosaurs. <laughs> Says a person who studies sauropods. Biased. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> anyway, you can see Shunosaurus at the Zigong Dinosaur Museum in Sichuan Province and the Tianjin Natural History Museum in Tianjin, China. And our fun fact of the day is about an article that a lot of people have read and pointed out. It's all about whether or not dromaeosaurs or raptors hunted in packs. There's a lot of debate over that. There is. So we've talked about it quite a few times in the past as well. Basically, the original argument for raptors hunting in packs, as far as I know, came from Ostrom in 1969, where he proposed they were hunting like wolves. And this is based on the fact that Deinonychus is often found together near Tenontosaurus. So multiple Deinonychus near a single Tenontosaurus, which is a big hadrosaur. So in order for a Deinonychus, which is very small, like significantly smaller than us, to take down something that's like a huge cow, <laughs> there would have to be more than one of them is the idea. And therefore, they must have hunted in packs. That was the idea in 1969. But there are other places that have a ton of predators together. For example, the Cleveland Lloyd Quarry has a bunch of Allosaurus, and most people don't consider them to be pack hunters, although it has been proposed. Some of the other reasons given for the Cleveland Lloyd Quarry include that multiple Allosaurus were drawn to a dead animal and then stuck in the mud or poisoned or they all died from drought or another possibility is that they died elsewhere but the bodies were pushed together later in the taphonomy and then they just got buried together and fossilized together even though they weren't hunting or dying together our longtime listeners might remember that in 2018 we covered an svp presentation about deinonychus pack hunting by joseph Fredrickson, and this new paper is also his so it's basically the peer-reviewed version of that talk that we covered two years ago. It was published in Paleogeography, Paleoclimatology, and Paleoecology. But quickly, to summarize what we talked about back in 2018, Fredrickson pointed out that there are many advantages to pack hunting. Some of the big advantages are you can take down bigger prey. For example, wolves can take down larger animals than a single wolf would be able to on its own. They also have a higher success rate. If you imagine something like a lion trying to track down prey. Sometimes more of them will lie in wait and then pounce out so uh, it can't escape. You can trap them. Yeah, exactly. You're probably also less tired. Yeah, it, it leads to shorter hunts because you don't have to just chase it and chase it like a single cheetah and whoever tires out first <laughs> loses. If you have multiple individuals, you could either trade off or otherwise just catch it quicker. You can also protect the prey from predators, meaning other predators. So if there's a group of lions together and a single other predator comes up and wants to snack on the meat, which you found, the group of you might be able to scare the other predator away. And lastly, you can use group hunting as a way to teach as well as feed the young in your group. So it's sort of a self-reaffirming process the pack helps to train the next generation of the pack as well as feed it and then make them more prepared and so on and so forth. So it's obviously hugely advantageous, but a lot of animals don't do it because it's also time consuming to be in a pack and it comes with downsides as well. I also should point out there's a big spectrum to pack hunting. It's not just like there are pack hunters and non-pack hunters. The ones that most people are thinking about are the most advanced form of pack hunting, but also one of the less common types. It's called cooperation or sometimes collaboration. And that's what you see with the raptors in Jurassic Park. In it, you have different members that have different and complementary responsibilities. One example is like cetaceans with wave washing, where if there's like a seal on top of a piece of ice, several whales, killer whales, will swim towards the block of ice in formation. They'll make this big wave that knocks the seal off. There's also the Harris's hawk, which a few people commented about in articles where they were talking about this paper. It's a modern raptor, meaning a flying bird, 
that hunts things like rabbits in groups. So they have different strategies for this, but one of the main ones is that one of the hawks will fly in and scare the rabbit out of the brush, and then the others sort of fan out and try to cover all the escape routes. And if it darts in one direction, hopefully there's one there waiting for it so they can catch it quicker. As a result, they apparently have a significantly higher success rate than other hawks that try to do this solo. Some other birds reportedly hunt in small groups too. I couldn't find any primary sources on them, and I didn't see any other raptors too. More of them were like corvids, like crows and things that are known to be really intelligent. But like I said, they're not all super advanced styles of pack hunting. There are some less advanced types. So the next less advanced, meaning the second most advanced type, is called coordination. It's basically when you're all doing the same role, but coordinating the time and location. So the way I think of that one is like a few wolves chasing a bison, but sort of fanned out. So they're prepared for which direction the bison might turn. They're not really doing anything super complicated. They're all just sort of coordinating the same action at the same time and place. The next one is synchrony, which is basically all hunting at the same time, but they're not coordinating their actual locations. And then the least advanced is similarity. This example is insane, but apparently there are colonies of spiders, thousands of spiders that all maintain massive webs. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Which sounds horrifying if you have arachnophobia. But in it, so it's similarity, but they're not there at the same time or place. They basically just all maintain the web whenever they're around it, and they're not really interacting with each other. They're just sort of all in the same time and place working on the same thing. So they're technically pack hunting because they're maintaining this web together, but they're not, they don't need to talk to each other to do it. They just maintain the web. This is further complicated because animals don't always act the same. Sometimes they might use more or less complex strategies. For example, the wolves, you could all just chase something at the same time, or you could have a more complex coordinated attack where there's a wolf waiting somewhere and the other wolves are going to try to push them that direction. Unfortunately, almost none of this fossilizes, but Fredrickson proposes that two of the elements might fossilize Those are selecting larger prey and potentially whether or not they're feeding their young from larger animal kills. In order to test this, they looked at carbon-13, oxygen-18 isotopes in their teeth. This is obviously really useful in dinosaurs because they replace their teeth frequently. So if they eat something different, then a couple months later, they're going to have a new isotope in their teeth. Non-social crocodilians and Komodo dragons' diets change as they get older and hunt bigger prey, and therefore so do those isotopes in their teeth. And based on those isotopes, Deinonychus also seems to have had a different diet as it aged. There were some limits on the study, though. They had a limited number of teeth to work with, but the ratios were pretty similar in both Montana's cloverly and Oklahoma's antlers formations. So it was like nine point something percent of this carbon 13 in the adults and more like 10 something percent in the young ones and it was consistent in both places and what that means is that in both cases juveniles had more carbon 13 and therefore their prey quote likely composed of smaller bodied but trophically higher species end quote so in other words small deinonychus was likely eating something similar to a small lizard that was eating bugs that was eating plants, that makes it higher trophically than something like a Tenontosaurus that was just eating plants. So trophic is like how high up the food chain you are. So it was eating things that were higher up the food chain. But that's all we can tell from the carbon-13. It's unlikely that they were eating something the same size of Tenontosaurus that was a predator. (laughs) They're probably eating some small predator, like insects or a lizard or something. Or maybe, you know, baby dinosaurs from other places. Whatever's easiest. Yeah, never pass up a good meal. As a result, the fact that they were eating different things because they had those different carbon-13 ratios means that the young weren't in group hunts with the adults eating the same thing. The simplest explanation for this is that they weren't pack hunters because generally if they were pack hunters, you might expect that they were including the young in the pack. You could... If you wanted to say, well, maybe the young were creating a different group and the older Deinonychus were in a separate group hunting Tenontosaurus, but that's just kind of an uncommon thing to happen. So 
it seems more likely that they just weren't pack hunting. And when we find a bunch of Deinonychus next to a Tenontosaurus, it could be something like a bunch of vultures. Vultures don't hunt something together, but they do often end up in a big group around that thing together because they're all drawn to it. Of course, a lot of people don't like this, though, because everyone likes to think of raptors as pack hunters. Well, it's more fun to draw that. It is. And this isn't really definitive. It just is one piece to the puzzle. Yeah, so my guess is that this will be a long-running debate. I think so, too. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And join our dinosaur community on Patreon, patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.